We are recording. The chair notes that the time is 6.09, and I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is David Sloviter, acting chair for this evening of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, and I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We will begin with a roll call, roll call of the ZBA members. Uh, Chair David Sloviter is present. Everald Henry. Present. Philip White. Present. Craig Meadows. Here. And John Varner. Here. A quorum is present and we can conduct the meeting tonight. Also attending the meeting tonight is Ms. Jacinta Williams, town planner. Is there any other staff on this meeting from the town, Ms. Williams? No, okay, thank you. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended again by chapter two of the acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town of Amherst's YouTube channel and ZBA page. If you wish to make a comment, please indicate your wish to do so by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and town affiliation. Please put yourself back into mute when you have finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Zoning Board of Appeals Chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discon disconnected from the meeting. <clears throat> in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. 
for a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda. We've already taken the roll call and established that a full panel is in place. Uh, there are no minutes to be reviewed and voted on tonight. The minutes from the previous meetings will be addressed at the next ZBA meeting. For the public hearing, the first agenda item is ZBA FY 2025-08, Red Cardinal slash 253 Pharmacy, Request for special permit under section 3.363.2, recreational marijuana re retailer for the aforementioned use for the property located at 328 College Street, map parcel 14B slash 222 in the commercial zoning district. The second item in tonight's public hearing agenda is ZBA FY 2024-17, Jonathan Clayt, request for a special permit under section 6.3 and 5.10 of the zoning bylaw to create a flag lot and to construct a single family house on the premises at 47 Redgate Lane, map 11D, parcel 166, neighborhood residence zoning district. This item is continued from July 11 and from October 10. This will be followed by a um, public meeting and a discussion and then other committee business. So with all that said and everyone knowing what the legalities of such a meeting involves, we can move to the first agenda item where I have a lot of paper and a lot of trees died for this meeting. Oh, okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Craig has his hand up. Oh, yes. I'm so, right. Sorry. Does anybody, including Craig with his hand up, have anything to declare on this agenda item? Yes, I believe I do. Uh, I believe my cousin is an investor in this group, and I don't think it's uh, reasonable for me to be on this panel. Okay. If that is a conflict, uh, then fine. We accept that. That means there will be four people remaining, and that is an adequate number to do business. So thank you, and we'll catch you on the other side. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Um, anyone else have anything? All right. Since it deals with a marijuana dispensary, I won't ask if anyone has ever smoked marijuana and not inhaled. So we'll leave that out for now. So this, this the first agenda item, <clears throat> ZBA FY 2025-8, Red Cardinal 253 Pharmacy. Who is presenting and representing that, Mr. Silverman, right? Correct. Yes, so, can you hear um, me? Yes. All right. So and, um, uh, we, I will recognize you. Please make your presentation, give your name and address for the record at the beginning, and then please go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name is Phil Silverman from Vicente LLP, 800 Boylston Street, 26th floor, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm also here with Bridget Nickasher uh, and Chris Gallant and Seth Rutherford from the company. Um, and so hopefully they'll be able to uh, speak as well. Um, but again, I'm 
Phil Silverman for 253 Organic. They do business as 253 Pharmacy. And we're here seeking a special uh, special permit to operate a recreational marijuana retailer at 328 College Street. Um, this might sound familiar to the board uh, and others that are, are viewing because this site is presently operated as a recreational marijuana retailer by a company called Red Cardinal. Uh, and to my client 253 will be purchasing this facility and the associated licenses and approvals from Red Cardinal so that it can operate the facility. Um, before I get to sort of the details of the application, I just wanted to allow the principals of 253 to introduce themselves, uh, if I could. So Chris, do you wanna just uh, take it for a minute and then we'll go to Seth? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. My name is Christopher Gallant, co-CEO at 253 Organic. Um, good evening. I would like to thank the board and the town officials for their time this evening. Once again, my name is Christopher Gallant, co-CEO with Seth Rutherford at 253 Organic, also one of the founders. I grew up in Granby, Mass, graduated from Granby High, and now own the home I grew up where I live with my family. Before returning to Western Mass to help start a cannabis company, I lived in Nantucket for almost 20 years. I started a construction company out there that built homes from start to finish, offering caretaking services as well. My specialty was shop work. Having some of the, my work published in Architectural Digest while living on Nantucket, I've also built our cabinetry for our full retail location in Turner's Falls. As you'll go ahead and hear from Seth, we wear a lot of hats here at 253. Recently, the majority of my time has been spent in the manufacturing cultivation department. We believe in innovation through automation in that we've uh, automated our chocolate bar equipment, which allows us to go ahead and make 3,000 chocolate bars in roughly two hours. And we've most recently added a pre-roll machine to enhance our efficiency. We really look forward to working with the town of Amherst. Thank Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Phil. Um, good evening, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you for your time tonight. My name is Seth Rutherford. I too am a co-CEO and co-founder of 253. I grew up in Pelham and Shutesbury, attended Amherst Regional High School and Greenfield Community College. My wife and I currently live on Michelle's family farm in Hadley and have two children. Community has always been a very important to me, being a small town kid, and my hope is to bring my strengths back to Amherst to help my hometown prosper. In 2018, Chris and I decided to take a huge risk and pursue our dream of opening up a vertically integrated cannabis facility. Chris and I knew we needed a strong team to compete and beat the multi-state operators from corporate America. We decided to take our vision and dream to a family friend who introduced us to Marsha Wagner and Alan Shore. And soon after, all four of us became partners and formed 253. Chris and I, being, being operators, took on the responsibility of building to the Turner's Falls facility and then operating it. We built, we built over a 30,000 square foot facility in less than one year, and we were the 25th store in the state to open in 2019. We feel, 253 feels that we are a very good fit for the community for a few reasons. We are owner, we are owner built and operated, maybe the only group in the state that has physically built their own facility and operates their own facility. We are known for high quality products in Massachusetts, allowing for premium pricing. We're very proud that our entire management team has been here, has been with the company from the start, and nearly 80% of our staff has been with us over three years. We have no corporate satellite office. We're local and we're able to be reached for quick decision making. We are a financially stable and vertically integrated uh, company and we're positioned for longevity. We have great relationships with our current host community here in Montague and Turner's Falls. We are, we, are one, we are the only kosher certified facility in the state of Massachusetts. And we have been voted number one in Franklin County for three years running in the Franklin County favorites. I really, I, I would like to thank again, the members of the ZBA and we appreciate the opportunity to partner with Amherst. Great, thanks Seth. Um, now I'm gonna ask my colleague Bridget to share her screen. Um, and so that we can take a, a quick look at the site plan. Bridget, can you share right now? Yes, let me know when you can see it. Um, Bridget, could you give us your name and address please for the record? Yes, 
Bridget Nickashear with the Fente LLP at 800 Boylston Street, 26th floor, Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you. Okay. So here's the site plan. Um, and, and this will become a little bit of a theme during this presentation, uh, because the first thing I want to tell you is that we're not proposing any changes uh, to that site plan. Um, you can see uh, there's ample parking here. There's 36 parking spaces. Uh, from what I understand from the present operation, the lot has never been full. So I don't anticipate um, you know, problems here in that regard. We're not changing that. We're not changing any of the curb cuts. You'll have the same lighting. Um, there is, if you notice, sort of uh, on, on the left-hand building, you know, that's the, that's the building that we occupy. And it's that, it's on the right, the lower right corner of that building that we occupy. And you can see sort of an indentation there, which is, it's a covered area right in front of the front door. <clears throat> and that serves also as our secure loading area. And what happens there is there are some motorized doors that roll down over that area so that you pull the car in, in front of the doors, you roll uh, those motorized doors down and uh, you know we're able to do all of our secure deliveries. They don't take a long time. It's pretty well uh, orchestrated to, to be very quick and efficient, um, but that's where we do it uh, in that area. Um, and uh, again, no changes to any uh, of the security features. You know, any the cameras, uh, the lighting, the alarm systems, that's all staying the same. Uh, it's really not a lot of choice there anyway. That's all uh, Cannabis Control uh, Commission guidelines. Uh, we're not changing the management plan that's been previously presented to the town, operating under the same one. Um, just so, you know, we're all on the same page, this facility will operate uh, potentially from 9 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the evening, Monday to Friday and from 10 in the morning to eight in the evening on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we're not proposing any changes to the conditions in the existing special permit. Uh, we assume we'll be uh, operating under uh, the same conditions. Um, and uh, the floor plan, I'm not gonna, it, it, unless you wanna see the floor plan, I'd prefer not to show it just because it becomes a little bit of a security issue. Uh, I'm happy to do it if you really think it's necessary, but it's the same floor plan that's been operating. It's got all of the features that are standard uh, in these operations. The entry vestibule where you you go into the front door, but you can't get further into the facility without showing your ID, proving that you're 21 years of age and being buzzed further in. There is a vault area within the facility where all of the product is stored in the evenings. And then you've got your standard, uh, you know, point of sale positions uh, within the store. Um, so again, very, very standard floor plan um, that, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen in the other facilities in town as well. Um, the only other thing I'm gonna show you in terms of exhibits here, Bridget, if you could switch us over to the signage, this is actually the only change um, that you'll see. If you look to the left-hand view, you'll be able to see that that's the current view uh, for Red Cardinal. The right hand, uh, again, is the signage for 253 Pharmacy. Uh, so pretty minimal change. And again, not that none of these signs, you don't have neon lights or any of these types of things uh, that become a nuisance to the public. It's very straightforward. Um, apart from that, you know, I would point out, and Bridget, you can go back, uh, you, you, you can stop sharing now. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, we are working on a host community agreement um, with the town. I expect that uh, that's going to be signed any day now. We finalized some details just yesterday. Uh, I've uh, presented that. Um, I, I think that you may have received that. Uh, Jacinta received that yesterday. Uh, it's basically, you know, in that form that it's going to be. Um, but we, we're on, we have no real disagreements at this point. So I expect that to be signed any day now. And I'll also note that, um, you know, the process of uh, selling uh, licenses, um, you know, has to go uh, before the Cannabis Control Commission and be approved there. We're in that process right now. Um, I would expect, you know, approval will come probably anywhere from the next 30 to 45 days uh, during a public meeting of the Cannabis Control Commission. So um, that's our, our presentation. Um, again, 
I, you know, the, everything is really the same. So I didn't want to go into too much detail, but I'm happy to answer any questions if, uh, if there's any that arise or if you feel I didn't cover something adequately for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I neglected to do something at the beginning, so let me do it now. Steve would not have forgotten, but sorry. There was a site visit um, on Tuesday, I believe, uh, where uh, Everald and John and I, representing the board and just since it was there, we toured the facility. We walked the exterior of the building. We saw the adjoining spaces and, and we saw and went over with the people who are presenting tonight, the delivery setup. And we had the procedure for delivery confirmed with the roll down doors uh, and how they go about securing the space before they open the doors and when they do it. We also toured the interior and saw all of the things that Mr. Silverman referred to, the vault, the security system, the, the really cool money counting machine and everything else in the operation. So it's a, it's a, physically it's a small, relatively small space. So the tour didn't take very long, but the various components that were there, we saw everything. And I believe we can confirm that. Everold or John, do you have anything you want to add about the site visit? I think you covered it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. okay. The other thing that I would add, having read a lot of this today, especially the... Um, the project application report. There are a lot of conditions in the report that were carried forward and included here from the previous approval, from the 2020 permit, I believe it was. And they're included here to ensure that they continue to apply. It does not infer or mean that they are new or actually proposed. There's a condition in here that says that to protect people in a queue, they will erect an awning. Well, the awning is already there. So, you know, the, the thing that I personally took away from the site visit was that nothing is going to change except for a couple of signs and what the owners look like, but that's about it. So we were, the, the site visit was, um, it certainly reinforced all of the things that the applicant is saying tonight. Does anybody on the panel have any questions of the applicant? I, I'm as a chair. So I, I heard that the, the host agreement is not yet finalized and the version that was sent to us earlier on today still had the red lines. Um, and, and within the red lines, there were comments and questions. I want you to understand that those red lines were resolved and those comments were satisfied and there's a clean version out there somewhere just pending signature. That, that's what's going, that's exactly what's going on. Um, and so again, to the extent that there's a concern there, we're happy to have you add a condition, uh, to, uh, this decision, which states that. You know, we're not able to uh, commence operations uh, unless and until we have a signed host community agreement. But I expect that's going to happen any day. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Williams, this is the time for public comment. If, uh, if there's not, is there anything else from our panel? No. Is, does, do you see anybody who wants to participate, Ms. Williams? No, I don't. Okay, neither do I. Okay. Um, there are a number of things that, oh, right. So now we could leave the public hearing and go to a public meeting. And that's when we read all the findings and things like that. 
And to go from the hearing to the meeting, we need a motion and a vote by the panel. So is there a motion to move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open? Do I hear a motion, anyone? Before we do that, um, yes. just to keep, I think we talked about advising um, 253 that we are four instead of five and we need four votes just in case right. they wanted to. Um, right, right. We had talked about that for the second agenda item, but it's also appropriate here. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Henry. Correct. Uh, just Understood. telling you, right. Okay, do I, four, four affirmative votes can approve it, but there's only four people on this panel now that Mr. Meadows has recused himself. So we're offering you the option of continuing or with or continuing if you're concerned that there are not five people on the panel four of which you will need now there's four four of which you'll need are you okay uh, with are you okay to proceed i i haven't heard anybody express any concerns regarding this so if somebody has some let me know otherwise we're happy to proceed all right. Well, I haven't heard concerns either, but if you hear them and you decide to change your mind, by all means, we're ready. Great. So thank you, Mr. Henry. Is there a um, a motion to move to public meeting while keeping the public hearing open? So move. So okay. second. We have a motion and a second. This is a um, a roll call vote. Is there any discussion? No. All right. Um, the chair votes yes. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Varner? Aye. All right. So we will move to a public meeting and, hold, and keep the public hearing open. Does anybody on the panel have any questions, any comments that they want to make, any expressions of any sort relevant to this? I, I, given our site visit, Mr. Chair, and understanding that nothing is changing, and I'm, I'm I have no objections to supporting this. Um, I did review the conditions, and maybe this may be more of a question for Ms. Williams. On number four conditions, it says a violation of the host community agreements may result in the revocation of a special permit or site plan review approval. I'm just trying to understand what constitutes a violation of the host community agreement. Um, that I would have to double check with the building commissioner, but I do know that it is written into our zoning bylaw. Um, so I would imagine anything that's in there that is not adhered to in terms of the host community agreement and what has been agreed upon with the town manager would be considered a violation. I, I might be able to help you a little Thank bit you. here. Thank you, Attorney having Silverman. Seen, having seen this before, um, you know, there are obligations to pay impact fees, you know, once that process has gone uh, through the Cannabis Control Commission. So that's the type of thing that might be a violation. There's obligation. I think you're obligated in the host community agreement to pay certain taxes. Um, you know, there, there, you've certainly reviewed the host community agreement. Any, any violation of the terms of that agreement that you see in there, you know, that's, that's enforceable. And this is one of the ways it's enforced uh, is, you know, you can lose your special permit if you don't abide. Okay, so should the language say this special permit? Because it says a special permit. That makes we sense. We can to change me. it. We can change it. Um, one second. I generally do this while we're doing this portion so that everyone can see the same thing. Um, so we are looking at number four. And I yes. can change that to a violation of the host community agreement may result in the revocation of this special permit um, and we can put a date. I, I don't think 
No. I, I imagine that within the host agreement, there's a cure period that gives them a chance to fix that. So maybe not okay. put a date here. Yeah. Okay. So we'll leave it as is okay. or as amended now. Okay. And number 10, the applicant shall file an annual report with the ZBA. What happens with that report that they file? Um, I believe that we just keep it on file. But again, Attorney Silverman, you have more expertise in this than I do. Would you like to answer the question? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, for you to take a look at, obviously, to the extent that it raised any concerns. I think you, you probably have the ability to call us in and ask us further questions. Uh, so it's really just to give you an idea of what's going on, keep you updated on any changes, that sort of thing. And then if it raises concerns, we're always happy to come back and talk to you. But doesn't that require the ZBA to sit for a public meeting to review that? Um, well, it, it, it might, I, I'm not sure you can't have an informal meeting to discuss those. Obviously, to to the extent that you perceived after that discussion that there might be a violation of the permit, then I think you could, you know, act accordingly that way. But I'm not sure just to have a meeting regarding a report that you need to actually have a public meeting about that, at least at first blush. Probably later on, if you're seeking to enforce the special permit. Because I, I don't think, I mean, with open media laws, I don't think individually we can we can discuss outside an actual, if we each get a copy and review it, we can discuss absent a meeting. No, but you could do it at a, at a meeting of the planning board, I think. Okay. So maybe we can put something in there to say that once board members have reviewed it, if they feel like they need to meet, um, they can contact staff and we can do a meeting at the next, whatever the next ZBA meeting date is. Would that be something we could consider? Um, what does everyone else think? We certainly have no problem with it. Because I think we we had a similar, not similar application, but a similar situation where something was required to be submitted annually to the CBA. And the question was, you know, how do we manage that and who does it go to? Um, and does it make sense to have this condition in there if it's just not going to go anywhere? Um, so... I'm, 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 I think if the if it's necessary, we should leave it. But maybe, um, and I know just into that you're new with this application. I don't know how Ray Cardinal has done that um, over the last few years that, been, that they've been operating. Yeah, my I, understanding. I don't have my, any, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't have any knowledge. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, my under th this strikes me as one of those conditions that was carried forward from the original permit that was granted for Red Cardinal and was just brought forward to make sure that everything is still being uh, complied with. I don't. I'm not aware of the applicant having to file an annual report, but if that if that applied to the original, then it's five years or four years since this has been in effect. I don't know that it needs to be in effect, but I'm not uh, I'm not qualified really to make that decision. I do know from reading a lot of this that a lot of the conditions seem to be broader state regulations that apply to the marijuana industry. It's a lot of oversight. And they these um, these conditions seem to be carried forward into all of uh, into this document. So I don't know that it's of specific concern. If you're concerned yeah. and we want to do it, we can do it. 
it, it's not that I, I want us to do it. I don't want them to do something that's not necessary. I mean, what exactly would go into this annual report? Yeah, I mean, one, uh, of, one of the things that is noted in a lot of the um, project application report is that the staff says the the panel, the ZBA may want to confirm that certain things are still being done. And pretty clearly from the site visit and from what Mr. Silverman has said, it's all still in effect. And Red Cardinal apparently has a good record of compliance. But I, th I think that's um, in, in a in a day to day operation perspective, wouldn't that be either town, you know, the building commissioner or inspectors to make sure that they're in compliance, not necessarily the ZBA? I would think that makes much more sense to me. Yeah. So. Um, I, I don't necessarily think we need to have them do something that serves no legitimate purpose. So I would say table number 10 and check in with the building commissioner and see if it's absolutely necessary. And if it's not, I don't think we should put this on them for no reason. I agree. I agree as well. Should we just remove it? I, I'd be more comfortable if we check with the building commission and see what Red Cardinal did, and if it actually made sense it, with whatever, if they had to submit something. Can, can I can I make a suggestion? Because, you know, we're obviously very anxious to try to get this approved tonight uh, right. without delay. Um, and I understand if you feel we can't, but um, how about if you change it to say, upon request of the building commissioner, we'll do it. That way, you know, unless there's some good reason, um, you know, we wouldn't have to do it. I can I can be fine with that. Upon request of the building commissioner, the applicant should file an annual report. Or just a report if you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, like a report regarding the last 12 months of operation. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you. Glad we resolved that. Anything else, Mr. Henry, that you've come up with? Um, I I agree with you with all that a lot of it is state regulations. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily see um, any changes to be made other than those two that I felt were local to town of Amherst. So other than that, I'm, I'm fine with the conditions as they are. Good. Okay. Uh, Mr. I, Chair? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so if we can go back to 10, uh, Ms. Williams, uh, you actually had highlighted mm -hmm. what I had a question on. So yeah, um, with changing that, won't we also need to remove after annual report, just delete with the Zoning Board of Appeals and shall appear before the board so that number 10 would then read, upon the request of the building commissioner, the applicant shall file an annual report to present the report no later than 30 days. Because it would be, why would we have them report before us if they're presenting a, something to the building commissioner? You know. Can I take that out? Mr. Henry? Oh, that's fine. And, okay. but, but, just to, um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm not going against something that serves a purpose. I would like to add, and the building commissioner may refer reports to the ZBA as necessary. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right. Ms. Williams, you have that? One second. <laughs> How dare you not anticipate our no? <laughs> <laughs> I did. You saw me highlight it. I just I didn't mean... <laughs> ask the question. <clears throat> okay. All right. 
So yeah. I'm I'm going in the interest. Are we done? Are we done with that? Are we, are we done with 10? Mr. White, Mr. Read? Henry? What does it, okay. I can't see your screen anymore. What does it say? <laughs> oh, you can't see my screen. Oh, I moved over. Hmm? Oh, it says upon the request of the building commissioner, the applicant shall file an annual report to present the report no later than 30 days following renewal of a state license or registration, providing a copy of all current applicable state licenses. The building commissioner may refer the report to the ZBA as deemed appropriate. Perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. So in the interest of time, effort, and efficiency, I'm going to go through a few things that are in the project application report that reflects staff response to things. And if anything, um, if I mention something that anyone objects to, please leap. Um, this, the the, um, the staff or the applicant has provided sufficient evidence indicating they meet the requirements of the state and the town of Amherst. I agree. Uh, the, the staff says the board may wish to confirm the applicant that the conform confirm with the applicant that the following provisions are still in effect. It has to do with parking and the uh, store security and how to manage a queue with an awning. Uh, also, it has to do with parking, all of which will not change and seem to be handled properly. Business hours will not change. Um, other things like waste and recycling and lighting, we confirm that they are all in place and the applicant is asserting that there is no change to any of it. So the things that the staff said we might want to confirm, and largely it was the security of loading and unloading. I, for one, saw it and am very comfortable that it is currently, that the current operation is uh, conforming to the rules and the conditions. So I don't know that we need to spend time going over that since these were just carried forward. Is everybody okay with that? I don't want to rush through anything, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on stuff that's not necessary. Are we I, all fine? I am, Mr. Chair. Good, good. Okay, thank you. So next, I believe, is reading the findings. Is that correct, Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay. And just for the record, I am yeah. updating the project application report to reflect um, that these things were confirmed either during the presentation or during our site visit. Right. Okay. Well, we'll get to this in the findings. We will even confirm more things like the dumpster. Okay. Okay. So I have to read these findings for the record. Uh, section 10.38. Uh, 10.380 and 10.381, the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it's proposed. And um, we can confirm that because it's an existing operation. 10.382, 10.383, 10.385, and 10.387, the proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution, flood noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, and other, or visually offensive structures or site features. It goes on to list a lot of specifics. The staff review, overall, the proposal remains consistent with the previously approved site design and operational plan and would not constitute a nuisance. It also says because the day-to-day -day operations of the use have not changed, the packaging and interior storage of the marijuana, marijuana infused products and waste associated therewith provides appropriate safeguards against odor and pollution. Uh, the use has not had a significant impact on overall traffic operation. Further, the surveillance cameras and security system, this delivery enclosure, 
and the regulatory oversight by the town continue to eliminate any perceived or actual hazards to the abutters. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. And the staff review said that we may want to confirm that the uh, with the applicants that the following provisions are in place, lighting, surveillance, and a secured delivery enclosure along with a dumpster, and we do confirm that. The uh, 10.386, the proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations, and we confirm that. The proposal provides uh, 10.387, sorry. The proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and passenger movement within the site. Uh, staff review, no changes to the curb cuts are contemplated or proposed. So there's no change to the current successful operation. 10.388. The proposal ensures adequate space for off-street loading and unloading of vehicles, goods, materials. Uh, this again asks to confirm the, the, the delivery, the secure delivery and the pickup of unused, discarded and return marijuana and marijuana products. And um, this is one that's carried forward. It says the board may wish to ask the applicant how to meet and how they meet and, or fulfill this requirement. It's already being done. So that is satisfied. 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods for disposal and or storage of sewage, refu sewage refuse, recyclables and other wastes. And um, the staff review said we may wish to confirm that the uh, with the applicant that the following provisions are still in place and we are comfortable that they are. 10.390 is not applicable. 10.391 that um, the proposal protects unique or important natural, historic, and scenic and scenic features and I know I didn't see any when I was there. It's a strip mall. 10.392 is not applicable according to the staff. 10.393, the proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and exterior lighting. And uh, we confirm with the applicant that the following provisions are still in place, that lighting would be and is appropriately located. 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are wetlands located on the north side of the property line, but no changes are proposed, so the wetlands would not be impacted. Uh, the next 10.395 is not applicable. 10.396 deals with screening for storage areas, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, etc., And everything at this site that I believe we observed on the site visit is interior. There is nothing exterior, I presume related to security and operation. So we confirm that. 10.397 is not applicable. 10.398 has to do with um, proposals in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. It also deals with the 300 foot buffer and uh, the staff review said that it is in harmony. So proposed conditions, any questions about the findings? Okay, so proposed conditions of approval, but we did change number 10. And okay. 
Do we have to read all of the conditions of approval? Ms. Williams? Um, for the chair, record? Chair, judge would read them. He would all. then, so would I. Okay, proposed conditions of approval. Well, number one doesn't even make any sense because it shall be built, it's already built. Shall we take this one away? I think so. For for this application, I don't think that it shall be built and any deviation, they only want to deviate from the sign. So I don't think that that's an issue. Number two, no marijuana shall be smoked, eaten, or otherwise consumed or ingested on the premises. Okay. The hours of operation, 9 to 8, Monday through Friday, 10 to 8, Saturday and Sunday. That remains the same. A violation of the host community agreement may result in the revocation of a special permit. All aspects of the recreational marijuana retailer relative to sales, distribution, dispensing, or administration must take place within the enclosed area as defined by 935 CMR 500.002 and shall not be visible from the exterior of the business. No outside storage of marijuana related supplies or educational materials is permitted. The marijuana facility shall be ventilated in such a manner that no odor from marijuana can be detected outs um, outside of the property or on any adjoining property. The applicant shall provide the police department, fire department, building commissioner, board of health, and permit granting authority with the names, phone numbers, mailing and email addresses of all management staff and key holders, including a minimum of two operators or managers of the facilities identified as designated contact persons to whom notice should be made if there are operating problems associated with any use associated with a special permit. This list shall be submitted prior to the opening of the marijuana facility, or in this case, the transfer to the new to the applicant. Any such contact information shall be updated as needed to keep it current and accurate. One of the two designated contacts as described in condition 10, I think that was condition eight, shall notify the police department and the other town agencies in writing to any change of management of a facility regulated under this section. Number 10, we already dealt with and changed. Number 11, the designated contact persons as indicated in condition eight shall be required to respond by phone or mail within 24 hours of the time of contact regarding an inquiry regarding operation of the facility by a town official. This special permit shall be non-transferable and shall have a term limited to the duration of the leasing of 328 College Street for the purpose of a marijuana establishment. Um, in the event of such expiration as stated in condition says 11, but that number may have changed. The applicant shall be required to remove all material, plants, equipment, and other paraphernalia in compliance with rules and regulations from the Department of Public Health and the Can Cannabis Control Commission. Um, a copy of the final certificate of registration received from the Cannabis Control Commission shall be filed with the building commissioner for the record. All exterior site improvements already constructed on site, including the driveway parking area and a lot of other things, shall be maintained in good working order, if that's the key here, in accordance with the operations and maintenance plan and Article 7 of the zoning bylaw. bylaw. Number 16, or whatever the number is now, any significant increase in vehicular traffic resulting in insufficient parking as determined by the building commissioner shall be addressed by the applicant with changes to the parking area or management plan after review 
and approval by the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public hearing. Do we want to change number 16 to not require approval by the Zoning Board at a public hearing, but the Building Commissioner can take care of it? Mr. Henry? Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. I don't necessarily think we need to bring everything to the ZBA. Right. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Williams, would you change the end of what is currently 16, but whatever you change that number to since you dropped number one? I haven't uh, officially dropped number one yet. I'll do that oh. after we're done with oh, everything. Oh, okay. Then, we're, then it's still 16. Yes. Shall, shall be addressed by the applicant with changes to the parking area or management after review and approval by the building commissioner. Okay. Okay. This use shall be operated in conformance with the approved FY2020 and FY2025 management plans. Any change in the management plans shall require the review and approval of the ZBA at a public meeting. That we can leave alone because that's what we do. A maximum, the next one deals with the maximum total occupancy of no more than 22 customers and seven staff members for a total of 29, unless reviewed and approved by the ZBA. The next one is, um, the next number 19 is a carryover from the original. So this is already, uh, in place. So it probably should say all exterior lighting shall be maintained so as to be shielded at, or downcast. You can take out designed and installed, I think, since Done. it's already there. Just put maintain. Number 20, the applicant shall be responsible for all costs associated with temporary no parking signs the use of Amherst police officers and any other costs related to vehicular and pedestrian traffic that can stay. If deemed necessary by the police department, a detail police officer shall assist with traffic. Uh, number 23, the applicant shall arrange for an inspection, an inspection of the marijuana establishment in common areas by the police by the police department prior to business opening and correct efficiencies i can't imagine why the next one's even here but doesn't do any harm any oil or gas spillage occurring in the loading area i guess that would mean a leaking gas tank um shall be soaked up by an absorbent material and properly disposed of. Number 24, all exterior lighting shall operate from dusk to 11 p.m. seven days a week. Light shall be activated by a photoelectric cell and turned off by a timer. All lighting must comply with dark sky requirements. Number 25 has to do with the ownership of the property. And if that are separated, if the ownership is or the or the parcels are separated and executed parking license or easement with a proof of marginal reference must be registered. OK, the entire building shall provide a sprinkler system. I presume that's already the case. I can't don't know how we can what we more we could do. Twenty seven before the issuance of the building permit. Uh, 27, I think, should just be removed. You okay, okay. with that, Mr. Henry? My contract yes. specialist? Okay. <laughs> uh, because it's already built and the awning's already there. Uh, and the last one, if the host community agreement has not been executed by the time of the start of the public hearing, the applicant must provide the ZBA with a copy of the signed a um, host community agreement as approved by the town manager within 30 days of the issuance. So we already discussed that. Is this adequate? Is this an adequate? Is, is this condition adequate, least stated? For Attorney what they Silverman? Need to do? 
I think it is. Uh, attorney so Silverman. It, yeah, it you, works for me. It's fine. Does it work for you, where Mr. Is, Henry? So we're about to conclude the public hearing, and we still don't have a final version. Um, so maybe simplify it to say this special permit is only valid upon execution of the host community agreement. That may, that's, that's fine. That it becomes valid upon that. Yes, Mr. Silverman. That's fine. Okay. Yep. All right. So change that and then however long it takes. So the special permit is only valid upon ex execution of the host community agreement? Yeah. Okay. I will take out the rest. Okay. Any panel members have any comments, any further comments on any of the conditions or findings? So I think the next thing we do is vote, I believe, to approve the findings. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the conditions. The conditions and the findings as reviewed and amended. Um, so do I, I'm happy to entertain a motion that we approve the conditions and findings as reviewed and amended. Do I hear so such moved. a motion? Uh, uh, Mr. Henry moves. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. White, second. Is there, uh, it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this motion? None heard. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. And Mr. Varner. Aye. The motion passes. Uh, now is there any, to, pardon me? Now we vote to grant the special permit right. with the conditions. Right. So now, every, um, now the next thing is to vote on the permit itself, the application itself to grant the special permit, including the conditions and findings that we have just approved. Do I hear such a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Second. Go ahead, Mr. Varner. I second it. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. The motion is moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, the chair votes aye. Mr. Varner. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. The vote is four to nothing in approval. The motion passes. Uh, Mr. Silverman and your gang of sidekicks, you, uh, you have your approval. Congratulations. We wish you the best and we wish you success. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. You are on welcome. an unrelated note, Mr. Silverman. Good on yes. you for spelling your name the right way. <laughs> okay. oh. Yes, all the the club, the Philip Club. That's a very <laughs> specific joke that only oh people with name Philip with one L would get. But <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you all very right. much. You're welcome. <laughs> Good night, all. Good luck. Everything. Now we just have to close the public hearing. Right, and we should vote on that. So now we will vote to close the public hearing on the um, 253 pharmacy application that we just approved. Do I hear such a motion? So moved. Thank you. Do I hear, and Mr. Varner seconds. Is there any discussion? I don't hear any. The vote um, occurs on the roll call. The chair votes aye. Mr. Varner. Aye. Mr. White with one aye. L. 
<laughs> Mr. Henry. I actually I should have said Mr. White with no L's. You know, so if there's no L in white, just in case you weren't sure. All right, the motion passes for nothing. Uh, the public hearing is closed on that application. Whatever number it was, I already moved it, but we all know it's the uh, 253 pharmacy application. So that one is finished. We are now prepared to move on to the second agenda item for the night, which is the um, application for Mr. Clayt for 47 Redgate Lane. Um, Mr. Chair? We normal yes. Oh, yeah. You might have been doing it. Go ahead. I was going to say, we normally stop for a break at 7.30, and we're getting close to 7.30, and the next one is definitely going to be more than 15 minutes. So I suggest we take a five-minute break, and let's try and keep it to under six, and we um, <laughs> will meet back here. <laughs> In, in five minutes, and we will welcome back with eager and open arms, Mr. Meadows for that one. And uh, so five minutes, and we'll see you all here.
Welcome back, Mr. Meadows. Why, thank you. You're welcome. I know I, for one, missed you. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Well, see I, true. I think see you did a true. far better job than I would have done, so thank you. I did. You're, you're welcome. I've seen you in action, and I don't quite accept that, but it's very kind of you to say. Uh, you, you are slow and thoughtful. I'm fast and fast. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so you're welcome to do it every time if you wish. Yeah, okay, good. Well, I can't wait for Mr. Judge. That'll be good. Okay, so we are now, we are now back. And I see Mr. Varner, so you can observe without uh, without your camera. Mr. Varner, you might want to, after I announce that you're not on the panel, you can mute and turn your video off and then hang around until the end. Very good. Okay. Are we, are we ready to go, Ms. Williams? I'm ready when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. All right. So we are now we now move to the next agenda item, which is ZBA FY 2024-17, Jonathan Clayt, requests for a special permit under section 6.3 and 5.10 of the zoning bylaw to create a flag lot and to construct a single family house on the premises at 47 Redgate Lane, map 11D, parcel 166, neighborhood residence zoning district. And this is continued from July 11 and October 10. So Ms. Williams, if you'd like to invite the applicants and representatives in, Oh, so oh, no. Mr. Sparkle is here, but I think Mr. Reedy is joining us. Okay. Mr. Reedy? I know. I'm I surprised know. too. I'm, I'm. <laughs> Maybe of, something I'm changed. <laughs> well, I'm amazed that he let a different attorney get in on it, the previous case. <laughs> me too, um, actually. Well, welcome back, Mr. Reedy. Thanks for having me, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Mr. Sparkle, and and is is Mr. Clayt here? Or... That was my understanding that he was okay. here. I'm a okay. little confused why I'm not saying there he is. He's got okay. my name on the screen somehow. That's a good trick. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So I I need to make you aware, make the applicant and representatives aware of something in an effort to be extremely fair. I don't want anyone to feel that they did not have the most fair and appropriate opportunity. The panel that is assembled tonight uh, includes four members who have been hearing this application from the beginning. The fifth one, uh, Mr. Judge, who is the permanent chair of the committee, I'm only acting chair tonight, is not here. That means there are only four participants on the panel tonight. And Mr. Judge said that we can go ahead and hear this and vote on it tonight if we feel we have enough information to do that. We can pass and approve an application with four votes. We cannot with, with three. So because there are only four people on the panel tonight, it means that when we take a vote, if we take a vote, all four have to approve this application in order for it to be granted. Otherwise it will be defeated because it would only have three votes. So I'm offering you the opportunity without prejudice to continue until you have a full five member panel in front of you, in which case you would be able to spare one vote. Tonight, you can't spare a vote. And um, according to Ms. Williams, there are no hearings in the foreseeable future where there are any absences that we're aware of. So we are prepared 
to go ahead. Uh, I'm just taking pains and I conferred with the rest of the panel before the we began the meeting tonight. And one of our members suggested this and it was what I was thinking and I approve of it. So I'm presenting this to you as a an alternative without prejudice that you can exercise or you can go ahead. You make the choice. If you want to go ahead, we're ready. We're ready to go. Jonathan, you want me to take that? <laughs> uh, you're muted. So You're muted, Mr. Clay. Go ahead, Tom. And okay. then if I need to chime in, I'll raise my hand. Perfect. Um, so I guess to Miss Williams, just a question. S Mr. Judge has not missed any other meeting, has he? No, he is not, okay. Attorney Reedy. So then we could go forward this evening if we get to a place where, let's say, one member has a condition that we're just not willing to adhere to. We could request a continuation, wait for all five members. Hopefully, Mr. Judge would not also find that condition was appropriate. If so, there were no different position than this evening, but at least we're able to go forward, uh, hopefully able to convince the, the four members uh, of the proposal as proposed and um, receive approval. But at least I think we have that, I'll call it an escape hatch. So I think it's fine to go forward is what I'm saying. All right. If you're if you're completely comfortable, um, that's fine. We can do it. All right. If we, I just, if we get to a, a point of taking a vote tonight, I'm going to call for the motion. And it's, I would ask not, before. It's not necessarily that there will, that there might be a condition that someone isn't comfortable with. It, it could be that we decide to go forward. So I, I just want to make sure I'm bending over backwards to make sure that your decision is what you want. Yeah, and I and um, I guess a, a couple of direct comments to that, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, one is I'm I'm probably going to ask for a straw poll before you go to a vote, just so I know where we stand. And if I don't have the votes, then I don't have the votes. So that's number one. Second. Uh, I have to admit, I might be a little concerned at this point that the board is taking such pains to explain this. Um, but don't, I may not need to read into it. Don't, don't read into it. Okay. But please, I'm not instructing you. Please don't read into it. We just are trying to be as fair and, cons and conservative and considerate as we possibly can. Understood. Okay. Thank so you. we are prepared to move ahead with this then. Uh, I guess, Mr. Reedy, uh, it's up to you. Please introduce yourself as though we had never seen you before and give <laughs> us your address. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Ms. Williams. For the record, Tom Reedy, I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of Mr. Jonathan Clayt and his application for what is actually the, the fourth effort, because there's been three issued, uh, special permits for a flag lot at this site. Uh, with me this evening is Mr. Clayt, uh, who you've spoken to already, and then the engineer, uh, Bucky Sparkle, um, who I think did the majority of the presentation last time, walked you through the site, et cetera. Want me to get into it? I who I don't who who's going to do who's going to make the presentation, Mr. Yeah, Scott, I, I, Mr. I think Reedy. I'm going to. Okay. I, you know, because yeah, I think please. um I mean what I'll do, I'll share my screen just to reorient everyone to the site, then I'll get Bucky's plans up uh and we'll talk through it. But I, I think, I mean, somewhat frankly, it's a relatively simple request. Uh, for what we're looking for here. So let me go and just share. Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's a good idea to do um, a, a reasonable review. Those of uh, those of us who have been on this panel, <clears throat> I think the the first panel or the the most in depth panel was in May, and uh, seems like a long time ago. So I think it would be very helpful if you would refresh us pretty thoroughly on your application. Sure. Um, okay, so just to 
reorient the board and I'll zoom out just a little bit if you can see my screen, Amherst GIS map. This is the parcel right here. It's it's over two acres. It's in the RN zoning district district on Red Gate Lane. Um, you've got a, a denser zoning district, RG, just to the south. This is part of that RN zoning district here. I'll zoom back in so you can see. <laughs> this parcel uh, has sufficient area for a, a flag lot. The RN zoning district requires 20,000 square feet for a frontage lot. As you know, for a flag lot, you need double that minimum lot area uh, exclusive of the access strip to actually qualify as a flag lot. This parcel has that area. In fact, uh, as you'll see, the, the proposal is essentially for the two lots, the frontage lot, um, one of which Mr. Clay's house sits, and the other is going to be this flag lot. Um, the, the flag lot is about 48,000 square feet, and this is 54,000 square feet. And so when you look in the neighborhood, you know, if you start to, to poke around for what size lots do you have, you know, you've got 37,000 43,000, 43,000, 43,000, 80,000, 55,000, 31,000. So you'll, this is by way of comparison, another 60,000. So you'll see that the resulting lots are appropriate within the, the neighborhood that we're dealing with. Um, I'll also mention, as I somewhat mentioned in the I'll call it a, uh, introduction, a flag lot has been issued three times before in 2005, uh, FY 2005-12, in 2016, FY 2016-25, and then in 2019, FY 2019-07. So there have been three previous zoning board of, boards of appeals who have found that this lot, and especially this portion of this lot are appropriate uh, for a flag lot. And I think that's, you know, a little bit of the theme of what we'll be talking about this evening. So that's that's the site. And Bucky, I'm going to pull up the plan. I may have you work through it a little bit. I'll, I'll go some high level, but just to get into some more of the, the details. And so we've got uh, on your screen... Uh, cover page, this is just a vicinity map showing where the site is in relation to um, middle school, high school. Uh, the center of town is over here uh, to the southwest. And this is a good example of what we call infill development. So really touching on the master planning goals of, of utilizing existing infrastructure and developing where we would argue development is, is appropriate. Um, why I mentioned the square footages of the lots in the surrounding area, it's not something where Mr. Clade is looking to at the expense of the existing frontage lot, which he reduce he could reduce it down to twenty thousand square feet. He's not looking to do that. He's looking to have two uh, reasonably sized and appropriately sized lots for that neighborhood, which is, I think, important to remember. We've got an existing conditions plan here. Uh, showing what that division would look like. Maybe I'll zoom out just a little bit so you can see the entire scope of it. For context, you've got, uh, this is the west, uh, east is page north, uh, page up, sorry, uh, left is north and then south is to the right. You've got 47 Redgate Lane over here, about a 3,200 square foot footprint. You've got 63 Gate Lane here. And in 63, for a little bit of history, this subdivision, which is what it was where Redgate Lane is, had essentially like double lots where you have this lot and then you had a lot back here as well as this and the one behind it. Um, and so when you go back into history, these lots were actually combined and um, was ultimately sold and Mr. Clayt acquired it. Uh, as a flag lot to, I think, preserve, um, you know, his buffer in this area. So we've got the flag lot shown. We've got the existing topography, the existing 
trees in this area. We've got the utilities down along the street, uh, water and sewer. So it's public water, public sewer. We're not talking septic system. We'll scroll down to the next one. And then this is the proposed conditions plan. And this is, you know, as, as you know, as, as the board, you know, we've done plenty of flag lots. This is what the board asks for, right? They ask for grading. They ask for what does the road look like? Uh, give us an example of the, the building footprint. We did this on Canton Ave. We did this on, on Pomeroy. And those are both relatively recent for flag lots. And so this is not an unusual plan. And in fact, I'd say it's a usual plan for what the, the town looks at and approves with, you know, if you flip forward to the development application report that Ms. Williams put together and some of those conditions that she has, if there is a, let's call it a substantial change as determined by the building commissioner, someone's going to come back before the board at a public meeting, um, which again is usual. If the change is so drastic uh, in the building commissioner's eyes that it would warrant a public hearing, then there's actually a modification of the special permit that would exist, which again is completely typical for what how you deal with these flag lots. And so you've got your, and I'll zoom in a little bit here. And Bucky, if I step on my toes at all, just jump in, please. Um, but we've got your access road here with your appropriate grade at the street and the 10% grade as you get into the site, it's a 12 foot wide driveway. There's a proposal for uh, evergreen vegetative screen on the northerly side of the property. You can see that there's the existing vegetation. There's the woods based on the survey. The intent is to have vegetation in this area here um, to screen to the greatest extent, I think practical, this 63 Redgate uh, lane. You pull in, there's additional vegetation, a minimum mature height of 10 feet. As you travel into the driveway, you've got electric on um, one side. And then I think, Bucky, correct me if I'm wrong, but water and sewer potentially on, on the northerly side of the driveway. You come in, you've got a, a turnaround, which we've got a slide showing that it's adequate for the fire truck. We've got some additional screening here. One of the things to note is 68 Maplewood has cleared a significant amount of their own vegetation. Uh, but regardless of that, the applicant would propose to, to have the approval conditioned on this plan, which includes a minimum of 10 feet of uh, 10 foot height at uh, maturity for evergreen vegetation all in these areas here. Um, you've got your setback lines and you've got your infiltration basin. One of the things to remember is single family homes do not need to meet the Massachusetts stormwater standards. So this is above and beyond. I've worked with Bucky on many projects. He's always very conservative. His projects always work. I'm very comfortable with what he has designed here. And you'll see that there's a, a you know, a, a modest size home, especially in relation to the neighborhood. You've got a couple of decks, a yard, a flat, flattened out area for the yard, and then some grade down to this infiltration basin down in the uh, northeast corner of the property. Uh, we've got some technical details which we don't necessarily, we can, we can pin them if you want. And I don't know that the plan I have has the fire truck turnaround. Um, I think you have it, but there is this hammerhead where the fire truck can in fact pull forward, pull back, and then pull back down the driveway if and as necessary. Um, lighting would be downcast and comply with the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals, so dark sky compliant. Um, we've submitted a, a management plan as well as far as, you know, it, to put it into context, this is a single family home and you don't have a lot of those concerns if it was a non-owner occupied duplex or a multifamily or anything like that. And so, you know, when we look at the possible conditions of approval that Ms. Williams put together, I think we're fine with all of them. We think they make a lot of sense. I've seen them pretty consistently implemented with other flag lots uh, that we've been through in the town. And so I'll pause there. Bucky, if there's something else that that you want to add, by all means, please add it. And if the board has any questions, um, let me know. I 
I, I just have one question, Mr. Attorney Reedy. So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, there's an intent to build a single family house on this flag lot. Someday somebody is going to build a single family house. I, I, I'm not representing that Mr. Clayt is going to be that person. Um, it's likely to be someone else, but that's somewhat the fundamental purpose of getting the flag lot permitted is to sell it for somebody to build that single family home. And so, okay. you know, my, my bigger point, uh, attorney Henry is that this is typically how the flag lot approvals come is with some footprint. Like, and I just, I mean, frankly, just dealt with this on 82 Pomeroy. We had an approval. I want to say back in 2021, uh, the lot sold and then sold again to the instant owner. And I went back and forth with Ms. Demora a little bit because nothing had been built, but we talked about the lapse of the special permit or frankly, the lack of lapse because there was a reliance on the existence of that special permit as a flag lot. And that's how it transacted. And similar for, for Canton Ave, which is just around the corner from here, where the existence of the flag lot and, and that transaction is sufficient because that's what this is really doing is creating that lot. And then in for the Pomeroy, the, those new owners are just coming in. There's no changes proposed to the plan. And they're saying, this is what we're going to build. And so they're going to go and just get that building permit. So that's we see that same process here. And if there were changes, you know, in conversation with Mr. Moore on 82 Pomeroy, then you'd have to go through a modification process, potentially, depending upon the scope or extent of those changes, uh, that may require coming back to you at a public meeting or a public hearing. Uh, we, I understand, um, and we're not actually discussing Pomeroy, we're discussing Red Gate. So I think Mr. Henry's question is actually relevant and one that I have written down. Does Mr. Clayt intend at in any way to be the part the to build the home that is proposed or is the plan for this lot that mr clayt will not build a home and and it will be sold to someone else yeah i i think the plan is that it will be sold for someone else okay so mr clayt has no plans to build i'd right? say no at this point but um Things can change. Sure. Good. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, my first option at this point would be to to sell the lot, just as I did previously uh, to uh, to another buyer when it was permitted by the board in 2016. Uh, but I do have the idea that it is possible that I would build a house and then sell the lot uh, to someone as a completed house. That is less likely than I will sell the lot okay. and the future owner of the lot uh, will build. Okay. Um, and, and Mr. Clay, just so I don't get in trouble, could you, and even though we know who you are, could you tell me, tell the board your name and your address for the record, please? Sure. I'm Jonathan Clay. I reside at 47 Redgate Lane in Amherst and and this uh, proposal for a building lot is presently part of my residential property. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions before I go to other um, ZBA members. Um, Mr. Reedy, you mentioned that the buffer would be 10 feet high at maturity. And I would like to get an idea. How long is it? until maturity and how tall are the the uh, plantings that you're committed to put in i know that if you find the tallest possible uh plants to put in it costs more than the shortest possible plant so what is the tallest possible new plant you could put in and how long will it take for that to reach 10 feet maturity? Sure. Uh, great question, Bucky. I'm probably going to punt it to you and, and Jonathan as well. But, you know, I don't think we're talking about a, a foot tall arborvitae here. We're, we're talking about something probably a, a, a little bit taller. I just don't know budgetarily, Jonathan, and, and through Bucky, if we're talking about three to four feet, four to five feet, um, and, and what you're thinking. I'll speak first, but Bucky, please uh, you feel welcome to participate. 
Um, I would have the question as to when these plantings would be expected to be put in. But I assume it would be subsequent to construction of a house when all of the site work is done and there can't be any construction sort of as a, as a last step, as a visual barrier of a house that is built or is, do I misunderstand that? I don't, I don't know specifically, but I would think that the buffer plantings would be made in a very timely manner after at a minimum, the completion of construction. Once construction is completed, unless the ground is still frozen, I would think you would be able to plant very promptly after there is no more construction as you're referring to damaging the plantings. But I'm curious about how, how tall, I guess Mr. Sparkle would know this perhaps best, what is the tallest normally available um, evergreen, whatever you're going to put in there, that you can get in order to shorten the time to maturity. Obviously, yeah, we accept that not putting in a one-foot arborvitae, but slightly larger than a one-foot arborvitae is a one-and-a-half-foot arborvitae. What's a five-foot arborvitae look like? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I, I think from a practical standpoint, um, the, a, a three to four foot tall specimen from ground up is, is, you know, readily available and reasonably affordable. Also, I will say that the, the larger the species, I mean, obviously there's a, an exponential, uh, increase to the cost, but also, uh, there's an increased chance of failure of the plant. The bigger the plant, the more likely it is to not survive. The transplanting process, um, your your best chance is going with the smallest plants and nurturing them in place from there. But <clears throat> the the town typically has a a one gallon pot requirement. Uh, two gallon pots are still reasonably priced, and you, know, you can get three to four feet out of that. Uh, no problem. Three to three to four feet. And if we were more concerned about the height and less concerned about the price, what is the What's the tallest successful plant you have seen? Is there such a thing as a five foot plant that is likely to survive? I'm sure there is such a thing as a five foot plant that is likely to survive. Okay, thank you. I, um, Mr. Meadows, your hand is up. I, I am assumed that what we're discussing right now are conditions. And that one of the conditions that we're talking about is that these plantings would be done in a timely manner at the conclusion of, con of construction and that the plants would be pollinators. Right? I should <laughs> have Reed. known. I should have known. Yes, I, of I course. That one. <laughs> so um, those are the two of the conditions that I, I believe that we should include. It, and it really wouldn't be something that uh, Mr. Sparkle or Mr. Clayt would have anything to do with. Oh, right. Because they won't be developing because they will not be building the, the house. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. So it could be a condition. Right. Um, all right. I have, I have another one. Anybody... And anybody else with plants before I ask another question? Okay. On the site plan, I, there is a 12 foot driveway and then it looks like a pretty minimal parking area in the back where the fire truck, which hopefully they will never need, pulls in. And then I presume that the garages will be on the right side of the house as we were looking at the diagram, right? What happens, it, it doesn't, right. So that's the parking area. I presume that's the garage where your arrow is, right. It does not appear to me that there is much space to park cars 
other than the two cars that might pull into the two car garage and maybe one or two more in that space. You go down a 12 foot driveway and then uh, you turn into this small area. What provision is there for a normally functioning single family home when perhaps their extended family is visiting for a holiday of some sort? Thanksgiving, Christmas, who knows what, and they and six cars show up. You can't park in the in the driveway. That's a transit point, I think. So where would there be extra parking to accommodate normal function? Sure. So um I guess the 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 nice thing, you know, typically when I'm in front of you, we're talking about uh non-owner occupied duplexes and, and rentals and all of that here, we're talking about a single family home. And so you have those garage spaces, but it's also a single family home. And so if you have those two garage spaces and then folks park behind the garage and have to, I mean, I don't know about your family, but uh, we don't have a very big driveway. Some folks have to say, I'm leaving. Other cars need to pull out. And it would appear that there's probably sufficient area you know, this is, I think this is grassed on the side of the 12 feet. I, I would imagine that folks could pull off if they needed to, you know, in in these areas with their tires off of the uh, the driveway to allow sufficient area still to pass and repass along that driveway. Um, Tom, if I could add on to that. Sure. Um, the, the area of the hammerhead turnaround is almost 70 feet long. Um, if we were to do angled parking there, we'd be able to get an additional half dozen cars in that kind of space, in addition to whatever was in the garage. Um, and there is, to the south, a relatively flat area where if vehicles were uh, and ram rambunctious could certainly park on the grass additionally, this, this site should be able to get uh, eight or 10 cars parked uh, off the street, no problem, which is, I think, better than the many single family driveways. Uh, would be able to provide for it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I'm assuming that we are, we're, this is not the actual house. We are not voting on a house. That this, this is a theoretical position of a house that when it gets built may be considerably different than what we're seeing here. And, and consequently, we have no idea what parking facilities there may be, what there may not be. It could be a five car garage. Uh, it, it, I think we're we're getting our head of ourselves at this point. I'm trying to discuss a particular garage for a particular house when this is not what's gonna be built. We're not voting on a house. As far as I know, we're only voting on the possibility there may be a house there we're only voting on a flag lot. Is that not correct, Mr. Reedy? And I guess my question to you, Mr. Meadows, would be, so then if you were to approve it with that in mind, would that allow then someone to come in because single family homes are allowed by right in the zoning district and just to go to the building commissioner and submit a building permit and get a building permit for whatever house they've designed? Because if that- I, I assume that that's what's going to happen. We're we're not we're just voting on a flag lot. We're not voting on a house. Yeah. If I mean if that's if that's what the board wants to vote on to allow the flexibility of a new owner to just be able to submit a building permit to the building commissioner to get a single family home approval, by all means, we'd accept that. It, you know, unless Mr. Clay really would like to use this design and that's what he's asking for. Uh no. This was the the purpose of this design is to show. The, the size, basic confirmation and location and contours of a potential house. Uh, I would assume that if someone wanted to build a house, as I think you mentioned, with a five car garage, presumably a house much larger than this, they would need to come back to you. But this is not the precise house that I would expect to be built. 
Right. So that could be a condition. I'm not certain how it would be written, but the condition would be that we could put a condition, or I'm not even certain if we can put a condition for a single family house uh, of a particular type. We did have one flag lot recently in which we did see the actual house design um, before it was allowed to be built. Um, that the, was that the one on Shays? I believe so. Yeah, right. I remember and, it. And I don't know if we want to put that same type of condition here. Uh, I, I'm i putting the question up. I'm not saying that it should be one way or another necessarily. I, I don't necessarily think that we need to add a condition of a house because, again, to your point, Mr. Meadows, whomever's going to build a house needs to go and get a building permit and okay. deal with that process. Exactly. Now, now, right, you have your depiction here says 2,800 square feet. Can we, is that a commitment to, are you are you asking for permission to build a 2,800 square foot uh, house or are you just saying a single family house size to be determined? I think we would appreciate the latter. I think this is an example showing that a 2,800 square foot footprint house could fit very well onto this, on this lot. And a 2,800 square foot footprint that's one story high is 2,800 square feet. Uh, that footprint two stories is a, a 5,600 square foot much different kind of building there are are you um is your application would your application allow for a two-story house with this footprint sure sure or uh, i mean kind of stepping back to what mr meadows had said um the board doesn't have a lot of jurisdiction on single family homes you know as long as you meet the dimensional requirements. And so if someone wanted to put a, because what you're doing is saying this area, land, has sufficient area, meets the other requirements uh, as a flag lot. And so, I mean, as you all know, there's there's frontage lots, which say you have frontage on a public way with sufficient minimum lot frontage to be considered a building lot. And, and the board doesn't then look and say, well, but tell us, how big a house you can actually put there. And the building commissioner, frankly, doesn't say, well, you can only put a house that's 4,800 square feet. Like that doesn't happen. Um, and so similarly, we would say that this flag lot should go by the same. Like we are just creating a new lot that should then in the future be under the same um, kind of building commissioner jurisdiction for what the house could or would look like. Alternatively, this could be a, 1200 square foot house that or a 2400 square foot house but vertical right it's it's not the house that you're approving it's the lot with the the driveway and the access and i would say the vegetation hearing what you're saying about the conditions and the house is up to whether it be mr clay or a potential purchaser in the future of what that looks like within the confines of lot coverage building setbacks and and building code as a i'll just say because i'm on the roller coaster right now as a practical matter uh, building costs are quite high and so if you were to have a 5600 square foot house at about you know 400 dollars a square foot plus the cost of land you're talking at a two point something million dollar house for this area which to a certain extent wouldn't that be terrific for the tax base and uh, helping everybody else's value appreciate? So I think what we're asking for is the lot to be approved and then let the building code and building commissioner deal with what the house is. I, I understand. I'll tell you what my concern is. I haven't, I'm just thinking about all these various things. There are, abutters who have vigorously expressed opposition to this as being potentially intrusive into their, their way of life. 
And I am wondering about ways that we could address those concerns while at the same time not overstepping our legal authority if we can do something. Also, you know, I'm, I understand what you're saying about building costs, but a block away from where I live on Sunset, some people just paid a million dollars for a house and are putting $2 million into it. So there's, there's $3 million sitting on Sunset and it's not impossible that someone would spend $2 million. So what you're describing is not altogether far-fetched and impossible. And I'm trying to find some sort of a balance of uh, addressing the concerns of the abutters without opening it up that there's unlimited, virtually un unlimited potential to build here, depending on what somebody's willing to spend. I can't believe someone's spending $3 million on Sunset, but they are, and it's not my business. So, you know, it, is, is there a way that you can propose that your application would address the abutters' concerns without opening it up that somebody could build a 5,000 square foot house? Yeah, I think, I mean, the way that we've thought about uh, how to address those concerns is vegetation. Uh, buildings, siding, uh, stormwater, right? So we're we're trying to think of those things that can be nuisances, and mitigating those before they become nuisances. I think the board would have a very difficult time putting some sized restriction on what could be built here if it otherwise would comply, because then you know, going down that path, what happens? You say, well, it can only be X amount of square feet. And then Mr. Clay says, that's very unfair. I'd like to appeal that. And, and not saying that he would, but then we appeal it and we say to a court, hey, listen, all they're doing is approving a flag lot, but then they're also telling us that we can only build this size house. That seems like overstepping. I mean, you know, the, uh, 48.3 doesn't allow um, the board to look at like the interior of single family homes. And, and that translates a bit to the exterior, meaning what is the layout? You know, if we were here for a, a, a non-owner-occupied duplex or even an owner-occupied duplex, I think we're having a different conversation entirely because we're talking about the, the use on the lot. Here, this use is allowed by right. We're just talking about somewhat the lot. And so from our perspective, the only way to address that certainly is with what we can do to the lot. And so that's where, you know, this, the, the, the lot design and the vegetative screening that we're proposing um, is, I think, the best we can do with something like this. Okay, I understand. Are there any other questions from board members? I actually have one more if no one else has one. Um, Mr. Reedy, you mentioned that because it would be a single family home, it can't be a non-owner occupied duplex, which I acknowledge. Once it's built, it could it could it be a non-owner occupied rental? Could it be for students renting this house? It could. could it? Yeah, yeah, it could just like 63. Redgate could be for students, just like 68 Maplewood, just like 47 Red, Redgate. Right. Yes. Yep. yes. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? Board members? No? Wow. Okay. Um. Do any of the applicants want to make any more comments before we open it to um, to public comment? I think we're happy to respond. Okay. Um, Ms. Williams, public comment, I think, is next. Am I correct? 
That's yeah. correct. Okay. Does any do you have any indication of anybody who wants to say anything? No one has raised their hand yet, but let's give it a minute. I only see four attendees. Yeah. Do you, see, do you see more? I only have four, and no one has expressed that okay. they would like to speak. Okay. Fine. In that case. Mr. It, Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe in the beginning you did not indicate what materials we had received for this? You're right. I didn't. Um, okay. Ms. Williams, you sent me a list earlier. You sent me a link that I couldn't get. Okay. So would you, all I have is the lighting submission. Do you want me to include the resending of material from May as well? Or do you want me to just well, include I'd like I'd like to see the packet, I think. I have I have materials. Let me see. Okay, hold on. Do the do the other board members have everything? From May, you have everything, um, Mr. Henry? My packet includes, um, I, I think, the last updates from, I think, today. I have 13 items. Uh -huh. okay. I didn't get them. Why don't I have them? This was the email I sent. Earlier when we were on the phone, Mr. Chair? Yeah, well. Let me see if I um, have it, but I don't think I have it with Redgate Lane materials. Oh, I have those. That's the letters. Okay. Okay. Yes. I, I'm not sure if you're required to, but I you know I know that Mr. Judge always lists them out before we begin. So I'm happy to do what he does. We have a um an an earthworks estimation, a project application report, a project summary from Mr. Sparkle's company with specific findings and of yeah project summary and site description we have a letter from Yale first and Jennifer Mack um expressing their concerns we have the application form the management plan and the site plans which were already substantially shared with us by Mr. Reedy and Mr. Sparkle. And we have letters from a number from Kurt Wise and Rachel Browdy. And another Another two letters from Kurt Wise and Rachel Browdy dated November 1st and August 20th, November, November 1st, 2018, sorry, and August 23rd, 2016. And an updated letter, no, that's the same one, November 1st, 2018, same letter. And then I have the new project application form. So, and also the town of Amherst, what is this? I never saw a special permit from 2019. Right. Okay. So those are all of the, the documents that we have submitted. Okay, let me get out of this. All right. 
Mr. Meadows, that was the list. That's everything I have. Or I just, just in case I. Right. No, I'm. That's why I asked you to remind me if I omit something. Thank you, actually. I appreciate that. You're so, are there any? Uh, so, um, Ms. Williams, nobody is. Are there any members of the public want to speak? Um, now we have Ms. Greenbaum with her hand up, so I will promote her to panelist. Okay. Ms. Greenbaum, if you're there, I only yeah. see your name, but you're, you're oh, okay. No, 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 Can no, you no, hear no. me now? Yes. So um, welcome and please give your name and address for the record. Okay. Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road. And I just wanted to make a comment about the my experience with flag lots as a panelist is that you only have jurisdiction over whether or not it complies with the requirements for a flag lot in the zoning bylaw, which means does it have the buildable circle in it? Yes, it does. Is the flag lot 40 feet wide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all these other things you're talking about to appease the neighbors are irrelevant from my experience. And that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for the comment. That's good to hear, get guidelines. Thank you. Anyone else, Ms. Williams? No, no, no other hands. Okay. In that case, I would suggest that we leave the public hearing while keeping it open and move to a public meeting. And I would entertain a motion that we do that. Do I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Do I hear a second? I, I saw the muted face of Philip with 1L white, and I'll accept that as a gesture of intent. Uh, the uh, Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the vote occurs on the motion on roll call. The chair votes aye. Mr. Unmuted white? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. The motion passes four to zero. So we will move to the public meeting during which the board members can express their sentiment or thoughts about any of this. Board members, what does anyone want to express? I I, I can go first. Um, go ahead. My, Thank you. My position, my position hasn't changed from we first heard this. Um, this has been permitted now three times in the past. Nothing has changed. Um, it meets the qualifications. What's been built on there that we have building rules that whomever buys this lot has to comply with. I think that is irrelevant and not should not be part of this conversation. Um, with a building commissioner who oversees that. Um, again, this lot been approved many times, still meets the qualifications. I I don't think we should not approve it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mr. Meadows, anything you want to weigh in with? No, I agree with Mr. Henry. Oh, you do, okay. Mr. White? Uh, yeah, it looks like we're, or at least the three of us are in consensus. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I have concerns mostly in response to the neighbors. However, under these circumstances and with the input I hear from everyone else, I am willing to accept that it is really not the purview or jurisdiction of the ZBA to put conditions on this. Um, I know I would like that the buffer plantings would be as tall as possible and be pollinators, not just to make Mr. Meadows happy, but it, because it makes sense. Uh, I would like to 
I would like to protect the neighbors as best we can, but I am a little bit reluctantly persuaded that this really is just, as Mr. Henry says, not for us to try and determine. So I can also go along with the sentiment of my three colleagues here. Um, anybody else want to say anything? Because if not, we can go on to the next thing, and I will try not to shock everyone with a no vote at the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay. So now the next thing we do, I believe, not being Mr. Judge and going from notes, we read the findings. Is that correct, Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay. All right. Findings. I'm getting there. All right. Give me just a moment, if you don't mind, because I had I printed this all out. Okay. Specific findings required. Uh, section ten point three eight. 10.380 and 10.381, the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed as deemed appropriate by special permit granting authority. The staff review says that that is the case. 10.382, 10.383, 10.385, the proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution, flood, noise, dust, vibration, lights, and other, other annoying things. And it protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive uses of the site. The staff review says that residential use typically does not generate nuisances. Lights will be downcast. Just one single family resident residents would not generate meaningful hazards or inconvenience. And I believe all of those things, all of those requirements would have to pass the building inspector and the and would have to be satisfied and is not up to us. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use, new construction, parking, utilities, and refuse collection would be adequate says the staff, 10.386. The proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations, and staff says it is, 10.387. The proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjacent streets, property, or improvements. If the special permit granting authority deems the proposal likely to have a significantly adverse impact on traffic patterns, it shall be permitted to require a traffic impact report. And the uh, staff says that the proposed driveway provides adequate vehicular movement to and from the site, including emergency vehicles. 10.388, the proposal ensures adequate space for the off-street loading and unloading of vehicles, goods, materials, and equipment, and only residential and general delivery vehicles will use the parking and drive. So I guess this means the UPS truck can get up the driveway adequately, and that's all they're concerned about. This does not deal, I presume, <clears throat> with construction vehicles, but that is not us. Is that right, Mr. Reedy? Correct. Okay. Um, 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposable and or storage of sewage, refuge, recyclables, and other wastes. Uh, and uh, 
the new the new dwelling would be connected to uh, municipal water and sewer. Will the waste to the sewer be pumped uphill? It's a good question for Bucky. Yes, uh, the drawings do show a pumped force main. The, we're definitely downhill from the municipal sewer. So, um, so in in the event of electrical outage, there is no su sewage movement, right? That is correct. There would be uh, some amount of storage volume void space in the tank um, itself. That is a requirement. Typically, it's one day's flow, so you could be without power for 24 hours and still use water as, as usual. Although, typically, okay. people tend to scale back once they realize they don't have power. Can we make a condition? I would have brought this up before, but I didn't think of it. Can we make it a condition that they have a backup generator? that runs the sewage pump? Um, I, I will say that pumps themselves have extremely high amperage draw requirements. It, it would be a sizable generator. Um, that, I have that, a 20 kilowatt backup generator on my house that runs the entire house, including air conditioning. Uh, and, and my question is what kind of amperage draw does that handle? Because uh, a, a modest pump is going to be something like 15 or 18 amps while running. Startup may be more than 20 amps. That is a, a very serious load uh, for an electrical device and typically exceeds most residential generators. Okay. Well, my generator puts out 20 kilowatts. Uh, but yeah, my question was amperage there. It's it's a slightly different right. measurement. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll have to think about that then. Um, okay. You're downhill. You're pumping up. Okay. So the staff, the trash and recycling bins will be stored in the building <clears throat> or a shed. Stormwater management is provided. 10.390. The proposal ensures protection from flood hazards as stated in section 3.228. A staff review said the site is not located in the FPZ zoning district. The site poses no flood danger. <clears throat> 10.391, proposal, the proposal protects to the extent feasible unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features. Staff says that being a modestly, modestly sloped site, try and say that fast, the construction of any dwelling on this site will clear the majority of the woods. <clears throat> 10.392, the proposal provides adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses. The staff review says that landscape plannings are proposed at key locations to screen the new building and diminish the impact of headlights on nearby homes. 10.393, the proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and exterior lighting through use of cutoff luminaires, light shields, lowered height of light poles. Uh, staff review says all lights will be residential scale and, con and downcast. And I know that there are plenty of regulations covering this one. 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, and it does not contain any features, so that is not applicable. 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain. Staff review, the, the future architectural design will be per the next owner's proposal. There are no historic districts on or near the site. 10.396, um, the proposal provides screening for a number of things, none of which will be on this site, so it does not apply. The 10.397, the proposal provides adequate recreational facilities um, open law and the staff says that open law and woods are appropriate amenities for a single family home. <clears throat> 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw. 
and the staff says that it is. So, over here. Okay. <clears throat> That's the end of the findings. Any comments from board members other than me and my generator? No? Okay. Um, I could, um, Mr. Chair, maybe just the, I don't know that you need to go through it line by line, but just a generic finding that it meets the flag lot 6.3, the flag lot requirements. You've gone through the specific findings. I don't know if you want just a general finding that I know uh, Ms. Williams had put them together like line by line. You can probably just do a, a general ah. uh, what we're here for. Yeah, Article 6 on page 7. We don't want to miss that. Especially if it will get me in trouble. Um, flag lots, 6.8. Page seven. Do I have page eight? Oh, yeah. Page eight was above the findings. Page, okay. And you could even go back. I mean, now that we're talking about it, you can go back one more. If uh, Jacinta, you want to keep scrolling up, because in your public hearing notice, you also mentioned 5.10 with the fill. So if you go through 5.10, 6.3, and you've already gone through 10.38, that gets you all the findings that you need to make for this application. Okay. All right. I'll do that. <clears throat> so this is finding 7.0 general requirements. Uh, Two parking spaces for each dwelling unit shall be provided unless the permit granting authority determines that an alternate alternative ratio ensuring adequate parking use will be provided. The staff reviews that the applicant states the parking will be located in the garage. There is also available parking at the end of the driveway. Yes. 7.0001 parking spaces for cars shall be on a paved surface such as concrete, bituminous, asphalt, masonry pavers, oil and stone. And the staff said the driveway will be constructed with a bituminous concrete surface. 7.1, design standards and landscape standards. For paving, for the purposes of this bylaw, a paved parking surface shall be considered to be one which has a prepared subgrade, minimum of 12 inch depth and other technical information. The staff review says that it will comply. 7.102 slope parking areas will shall have grades not to exceed 5%. Driveways used exclusively <clears throat> for ingress or egress shall not exceed 12%. And um, both of these conditions are met. 5.10, filling of land. Any filling of land accessory to the development of property which raises the, the existing grade of any portion of a property 5,000 square feet or more in area by an average of two feet or more, or any such filling which raises the existing grade of any portion of a property 2,000 square feet or more by an average of five feet or more shall require a special permit. Uh, the staff review says that the finished grade of the areas impacted by fill will not be in excess of the natural angle of repose of the materials and that no surface no slope created by the filling operation shall be finished at a grade in excess of the natural angle of repose of the material. So this complies. 5.101, all filled areas which are not to be built upon within a year shall, upon completion of the operation, be covered with not less than four inches of loam. And uh, staff says this will be a condition of the permit. 5.102, no permit for the filling of land shall be issued 
If such filling will endanger public health, constitute a nuisance, result in a detriment to the normal use of the property, cause significant erosion, or result in traffic hazards. And this petition will not result in any of those issues. Section 6.3, flag lots. Uh, the area of this flag lot exclusive of the access strip shall be at least double the minimum lot area. And the staff review says the minimum lot is 20,000 square feet. The proposed flag lot would have 40,000, so it would comply. Mr. Reedy pointed that out before. 6.33, each lot shall have an access strip with a minimum street frontage of 40 feet. And the staff review shows a minimum a street frontage of 41.29 feet, so it does comply. And the access, the staff also says that the access is 40 feet at its narrowest point. It will be 200 feet in length. At no point does the driveway exceed a 45 degree angle. 6.34, the width of that portion of the lot where the principal building is to be constructed, known as the building area, shall equal or exceed the distance normally required for street frontage in that district. Staff review says the minimum street frontage is 120 feet. The building area is measured around 160 feet at its greatest extent. 6.35, that portion of a flag lot within which the principal building is to be located shall be considered the building area. The building area of a flag lot shall be capable of containing a circle whose diameter is equal to or greater than the minimum standard street frontage required in the district. <clears throat> the staff says that the minimum street frontage is 120 feet. The building circle with a diameter of 120 feet is able to fit in the flag lot, so it complies. 6.36, there shall be no more than three flag lots adjacent to each other, and there are no others, so this does not apply. 6.37, access to the lot shall meet the requirements of section 7.7, see below, okay. 7.7, flag lots, 7.701, unimpeded access shall be provided. 7.702, the driveway shall, uh, the driveway within the access strip or easement shall have adequate drainage and shall not exceed 5% grade within 50 feet of the intersection of the driveway. 7.703, in all instances where either two or three flag lots are created with their access, that would not apply. There isn't another one. <clears throat> Review says there is un unimpeded access. It's provided the driveway shall not exceed 5% within 50 feet of the roadway. It has adequate drainage and 7.703 does not apply as we said. Mr. Reedy, are you satisfied that we cover those? Quite, thank you. Okay, and I'm sure you meant to say beautifully done. You read my mind. I know, I know. Okay, so possible conditions of approval, not including a backup generator. Number one, the project shall be built and maintained according to the approved plans and application package. Any changes shall be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if submission to the Zoning Board of Appeals is necessary. Said, J said changes may be reviewed and or approved by the ZBA at a public meeting, or if the changes are significant enough, said changes shall require a formal modification of the permit. For the that one, Mr. Plan Chair, if I could, just yeah. based upon the, the conversations that we've had, I wonder if it makes sense after the first sentence to add an exclusion for the house footprint, which... Uh, shall only be required to comply with building code. 
So it would just read, the project shall be built and maintained according to the approved plans and application package, except for the house footprint, which shall only be required to comply with building code. And I would just suggest it because in the future, if if it's Mr. Moore or someone else and they look at the plan and they say, well, this is this is what the footprint shows. This is, and you're changing it based on this conversation that we've had about the, the lot being approved. Um, I don't think the footprint is something, I mean, we've talked about it, but from what I've heard from the frankly balance of the board members, it's not something that we should look to regulate. So that would be just, I think that's my only suggestion with the conditions that are proposed. And that would, that would reflect, I'm asking, that the submitted site plan, which shows a footprint, would clearly not be the, the footprint that we are voting to approve. That it could be any footprint that complies, not just the footprint on your right. That's the intent, yes. Okay. As I look to this little tiny picture of Mr. Henry. I what I, I, would have, I would have removed the condition completely. Um again, it 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 suggests that there's a project pending to be built, and that's not what we're doing. We're approving a flag lot that has to and whomever is going to build has to comply with their building codes and go through the commissioner. So again, it's I, I feel as it's almost redundant um, to be there because again, anything that's being built has to be approved by the building commissioner. Anyway. But that's, Already, that's, it's, that's it's my a take, requirement. Yeah. It's a requirement no matter what we say, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, do we then do we want to take this out while we're on it? This is the last business of the evening. What do you think, Mr. Meadows? You're nodding. Yes. Okay, Mr. White. You okay with that? I'm good with it. Okay. All right. So, um, take out number one. Man, we're just killing the number ones tonight, aren't we? <laughs> I know. I'm, somebody was over eager, and, and we are just so restrained. It's the it's a delight. All right, number two: all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass. Um, that's also a rule. I don't see any reason to, that we have to take it out. It may be a little redundant, but that one's okay, I think. Or do you hate it also, Mister Henry? I, I I had it as a remove also. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't um, all these weird. conditions these these are requirements? Yeah, these are requirements. So what are we right? So we'll take these are this is from, for from the 10. town. All right, so we're getting rid of number two. I think number three is important. We want to be able to find the place. So don't we want really good street numbers? No, we don't care. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll get rid of we'll get rid of number three. Also, okay. So access one through three are gone. Number four was in another thing already. Unimpeded access across the ac the access strip. Right? Didn't we already do that? I was okay with that one. I was okay with that one. You want to leave that, that in? Yeah, me I, too. I'm, okay. I am All okay right. with that one staying. All right. Yeah. Before the app, before the issuance of any building permits, the the applicant shall obtain sewer and other permits. I don't see how you can build without those things. Can we take that out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> Five bites the dust. Uh, all on-site stormwater features shall be maintained in good operational condition. I think we should leave that in because it that involves the retention basin or whatever at the bottom. Parking shall occur on improved surfaces only. Um, 
That was covered in seven point something, but we could leave that in. Trash receptacles shall be screened from the public right away. That we want to leave in because we leave that in everything. All filled areas which are not to be built upon within one year shall upon completion be covered with, that was in another section. I remember reading that elsewhere. So we can take that one out as being redundant. We can take out nine. So we're leaving in four, six, seven, and eight. We want to take out the one about the fill? It's fine to leave that. I know that in the findings, which you had read, it suggested that it was you could make the finding because it was a condition. So right. we're fine with keeping that as a condition. Okay, so leave in number nine. All right, so four, six, seven, eight, nine, we're leaving in, we're taking out the rest. And and so maybe one request to Jacinta is just, you know, so at, at some point, somebody's going to come forward to, to seek a building permit. And I just somewhere in the decision, make it clear that the, the board is approving this as a flag lot and it they're not wedded to this plan because I just wouldn't want a building commissioner to say like, no, this is the plan that was attached to the approval. And so you have to build it according to this, right? And that's why, however we can structure that, so it's in the decision so that I or somebody else can point to and say, no, 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 it's not based on this plan. It can be kind of whatever based, is, because this is a flag lot. Um, as long as isn't, that's in there, I'm fine with it. Isn't that inherent? to what you've been talking about, that all we're doing is approving a flag lot. And as Mr. Meadows pointed out, the the drawing of the house location and size is practically irrelevant. And I just want to make sure that that is embodied here because, so, I mean, you know how often I'm in front of you. Typically, there's a condition that says it'll be built substantially in accordance with the plans. And it doesn't say that here. And I would say that its absence is telling. But my fear would be that some building inspector, commissioner, if it's not Rob, um, would look and say, well, this is the plan that was approved as part of this permit. And so this is the plan you have to construct under. So all I'm asking for is to embody what Mr. Meadows has, and Mr. Henry, and, and kind of everybody has said. And that's what I'm asking Jacinta just somewhere to make sure that it's clear in the decision so that we can say, no, 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 no. This the flag lot was approved, not this plan. So somebody may come in with a, a a different plan, which is okay because the flag lot's already approved. Okay, I'm okay with it. How's Mr. Henry feel? I thought that's the reason why we took out number one because number one was specific to a project, and we didn't want that. Um, yeah, so I understand the attorney Reedy's position, and it makes sense. Um, I don't know if people would comfortable say, you know this permit is specific to the flag lot, not any structure being built in the flag lot. And that has to go through proper um, building commissioner channels. Okay. Do you like that language added to this proposed? Well, not that specific, that was vague. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, this permit is specific to the flag lot and not any structure being built on the flag lot. Okay. Or not yeah. or not to any structure depicted on the submitted plan. Yeah. Anything built on the lot has to submit to something. Yeah. Any structure must be approved by building commission. Is approving the granting of for the flag lot and only the flag lot proposed plan in this application was theoretical and any future builders are not you like the word beholden not beholden to the proposed okay that's fine i i don't want to disappoint you on the backup generator but is do are there requirements for backup generators any other place in town where this situation occurs I have no idea. I don't either. 
I, I specifically can speak to other um, applications that I've done in town where there were pump systems required similar to this. That was a, a six unit development on Prospect Street um, behind CVS. There's a pump system there. Uh, no backup generator was required. That system does have built into it uh, 24 hours reserve hydraulic capacity, which is the you know the the fail safe hopefully um, if um, we do lose power in those situations. I'm, I'm, does, okay. does 24 hour reserve hydraulic capacity mean just a 24 hour period or 24 hours of use? <clears throat> It is typically based on um, the t Title V. So if you have three bedrooms, <clears throat> Title V says you have to have flow for 150 gallons per bedroom. Three bedrooms is 450 gallons of uh, void space in your system. Uh, the reality is when the power goes out, usage goes down as well. So while it would, you know, if, if you were running full blown, you, you might use uh, that, that water up that void space in a day usually it will last for two three or four days um so having a, oh, all, all pump systems come with some amount of reserve capacity just because they do will lose power and this is not an mm -hmm. uncommon thing so it, they're always built in so so it's not a 24-hour period it's 24 no no hours. no it's just the average of... daily flow and it's a design flow and the design flow is roughly two to three times actual flow so you there's wiggle room built into it. Understood. And and Mr. Sparkle, on a lot, on this specific lot, if a house was built approximately where it's drawn on the plan, but we're not holding anybody to it, if they would lose power for an extended period of time and the system would back up, where would the waste go? If it goes into their basement, then I'm that's fine. Where's, where does the waste go when the pump's not working? That will depend on the plumbing layout for the house. Um, it, it would There would be various answers to that depending on how the house was constructed is the reality. But, you know, if, if it overflowed beyond the house, um, everything goes downhill. Right. Uh, it would be roughly... 400 feet or so before it got to any environmental sensitive area, um, which is um, a good a good amount of space uh, right. for uh, infiltration into the earth, which under emergency circumstances is you know considered generally acceptable if a septic system were discharging to the surface. <clears throat> usually that condition goes on for six months to 12 months before it gets repaired. And that's that's how we manage these things in the wild. I see. Okay, but even before it escaped the house, it would overflow into the house, I would think, right? It's quite likely, yes. Okay, so I should let go of the generator, is what we all think, right? Okay. All right, I'm a team player. Um. Okay, so panel members, are we satisfied Man. with the conditions? May I, may I ask a question? Certainly, Mr. Henry. So on the 2019 approval, it, it gave two years, and we're back here in 2024. Um, do we have the ability to go beyond two years? No. Do you, Attorney Reedy? I don't yeah, think so. It's uh, Let me look at your bylaw. So the state law allows you to go longer, but I think your bylaw requires two years, but I just want to check that out for certain here. Let me see as well. Yeah, 10.37 has special permit granted under this article shall lapse within two years of the date that it is filed unless it has been both recorded and substantial construction or use there under has commenced within this period. And so then... I'll somewhat harken back to my story about 82 Pomeroy and also Canton, which Bucky designed Canton as well. Once, uh, so if in the future, Mr. Clay were to convey this flag lot to someone else, that would be deemed to be exercised. You, a structure would not have to be built on it, which we, we don't even have to go down the road of previous ones, which that have happened to and whether or not they're still in existence. What we'll talk about now is that would be sufficient 
a conveyance. And so, but you can only put two years on. We can come back and ask for an extension before the expiration of the two years. That's not, I've seen that before and that's not unusual. Um, but I think your hands are tied a bit with the, the amount of time you can have for lapse. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have read the findings and the conditions. So I would. Mr. Um, Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, we ha did add the condition about the plantings. Is this ever, is everyone okay with this? This last one? Ah, right. Well, you, they had said that they would be 10 feet tall at maturity. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to word that. It's a concern. I don't know what, I don't actually know what to do. I would like, I'd like, since Mr. Sparkle said that five foot plants are likely to survive, that taller than that may not survive. And I'm more concerned about the buffering than the initial cost to the builder or homeowner. I would I would be willing, I'd be interested in putting a, a five foot minimum initial planting in there. Could Unless I just so, make a so, suggestion? So, Mr. if I could, because now we're talking about pollinators, <clears throat> and those a, a five foot, you know, I think of holly, Mr. Meadows, because that's what I think we've <laughs> we've learned over time, right? Before. But a, a a five foot holly is going to be a significant size and expense versus a five foot arborvitae, which is probably much more reasonable. And so that's my only, like, I, I don't think there's opposition to, to pollinators or, or evergreen pollinators, but I just think we need to be sensitive to the five foot requirement for pollinators versus uh, the five foot requirement for something like arborvitaes. And, you know, Bucky, I don't know if you've got more thoughts or insight on that, but, you know, if there's a down, like a one gallon holly or a two gallon would make more sense here because we're now using pollinators. Right. Um, I thank you for bringing that point up, Tom. Uh, the you know, one thing is, we, is this is very species dependent, and and some species grow faster than others. You might find that you could plant a very tall species is very slow growing, and you'll get much less screening over the next ten or twenty years than if you planted a smaller species that was much faster growing. Um, so uh, there, there's a whole bunch of variety in the natural world here. And you know, light and and shade and water also impact a, a whole bunch of species um, possibilities. So maybe if we said, uh, I mean, either we could talk about pot size and gallons, which is how nurseries think about this, and uh, they don't talk about the height of the plant. They talk about you know basically the size of the root ball. Um, uh, and perhaps if we said something like uh, the plantings to be as as uh, tall as practicable and um, instead of possible because you could spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and bring in a very large tree uh, that's possible uh, <laughs> and then spend another hundred thousand dollars trying to keep it alive over the next five years so uh, practicable might be a better term and perhaps um, 50 percent pollinators we have a lot of vegetation that we're talking about installing here and if it were all a monolithic bank of exactly the same thing, it's actually less attractive, in my opinion, than if there was some variety. So if we said 50% pollinators, that would still be dozens of, of large pollinator species, and then we could intermix them in a more naturalized way that allowed some variety, some landscape appeal, and, and make it much more attractive to look at so it wasn't just a, a, a big wall of consistency. And Mr. Sloveder, um, you may, Mr. Sloveder, you may like condition eight from the previous approval um, that specifies, um, you know, screening consistent native trees and other vegetation shall be planted along the north and south property line as it identified um, and maintained in perpetuity. So that condition is there for to provide screening. I'm not sure if you may 
that may satisfy your, re your requirements. Um, It doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't mention height, but it's there. Yeah. I can say that my my next door neighbor. We took down all the trees between myself and my next door neighbor. He's the chair of the landscape architecture and planning department at the university. He put in all pollinators two years ago. There, a variety of plantings in there, and they're all pollinators. They screen. his house from my house completely. I, I don't see any problem putting all pollinators in. There are lots of different types of pollinators. All right. What do you, what do we think? You want to make it all pollinators? I think Oh my Mr. God. Look Mr. at Clay that. has his hands up. Yeah, Mr. Clay. Yes, Hi, sir. uh, thank you uh, for recognizing me. A couple of questions about this, just to, to offer into the conversation. Uh, one of the areas that was on the plan that was designated for this planting of a barrier is along what would become my residential property. And I don't care about the screening at all. So I don't know how why that request how that would pertain to that, that particular boundary. But the other thing is, this seems to suggest that the lot during construction is completely denuded of all the trees that are there. It's pretty heavily forested right now. And if that doesn't occur, if a, if a vernal barrier of existing mature trees is there along some of what becomes these property <laughs> lines, Would these new trees be planted beyond that vernal barrier in, in, in the mid feathered into into those trees? Because uh, they may not all be removed. So I, I'm confused about that. I think your butters in one of the hearings, um, there was concern, specifically, um, there was one that had two children, and I think there was that great concern about when you start excavating, then there's no shield and they run, I think they played close to your property or on your property, if I remember correctly, and there was that concern from them specifically that with no... Um, barrier that was concerned for their safety, if I remember from that public comment. Is this during construction or subsequently when there's a house there? I think they mentioned during construction. I believe you're right. And so that would be a, sim sim a different question. The different, yeah. For example, a construction fence could be built during construction. But when it's done, now there's a house there. Now there may be a barrier of trees that were never removed uh, on the property of the new house. Where and why does this do these new plantings go in? Well, let me share. I'm just going to uh, just send this, maybe steal your screen just to show you the what we've got here. So we're talking in, in context a little bit more, if you can see. So, right. Right. We're, we've shown evergreen here, evergreen here, evergreen here. This is that area that I think Mr. Clay had said, uh, let's not require it here because I'm the abutter and I don't care. Um, and then I think his point here, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh we may be taking down trees to plant this vegetative screen and in, in my words now does that make a ton of sense to do is it is it better to leave some undisturbed you know buffer along this northerly side for the for the distance of the setback you know from this corner down here where you just leave what exists um and then i would think it you know and we'd have to think about a craft this Because right now, depending upon um, the location of the house, do you just leave it to the setback here as well? Um, or do you put in some vegetative screening? And, and maybe it's if there is clearing within the side yard front and you know whatever the setbacks within the setback um, as identified on the plan, then appropriate... pollinator vegetation shall be planted and maintained uh, to effectuate appropriate screening.
something where if it's there, why disturb it? Why disturb the natural environment? If it's not there or it's going to be taken down, then put something up uh, to screen. So, and I know that's different than what Mr. Henry's talking about with um, kids and in, in trespass, but you know, what we're trying to think about is that, that screening. So I think that's worth the conversation because for success, right. As I'm thinking about it now for success of these, do you have to take down the trees and is that something that the neighbors would would ultimately like or that this house would ultimately like to take down those trees because i know in previous permits i think there had been some requirement that there's like a no touch in this area and You're correct. maybe that's the answer is just to do a, a uh, no disturb yeah. here on the north property line there were no permitted there were no trees permitted to be removed unless there were a threat um, to public health. That's condition number eight on the prior um, special permit. So that's this line here. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then do we extend it? I mean, I'll ask you, Jonathan and, and Bucky, do you extend it to here? And then if you do take something down here, you have to put in some pollinator vegetation. I, I think that's trying to be sens sensitive to what it is that people want. Uh, I think that I think we need to, to try and find language that does that, that either the trees are there's a no touch zone and the trees are there or if they are not there because they have to be removed or they are felled accidentally or however they come down, then you need to fill that in. But to require planting when you might have 20 feet, literally 20 feet of forest, I'm not sure what the language is with, that does that. So could we could we put a condition that said that any, any plantings that are required to buffer the view from the neighbors would be pollinators? And that would not specify that any spaces had to be created. So Mr. Meadows gets his pollinators and we're not forcing anybody to take anything down. Is that right? I would say I would say definitely don't force them to take anything down. No, I don't mean I don't right. mean force. Right. No, I mean it, that if if as you say, if something comes down because it's a hazard or it's dead or for whatever reason something needs to be removed and a space exists where buffer has to be planted in order where something has to be planted in order to accomplish a buffer that new plantings would be pollinators i think that's fair especially since mr meadows knows very large tall pollinators exist so is that reasonable to everybody? Mr. Meadows? To me, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr. White? Yeah. Ms. Mr. Henry, you okay with that? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. So can you can you make the language that if it is look at that. You already made the language. Well done. Okay. So can I get rid of this? Um, I think if you get rid of that, then we still have to... Yeah, I think that's probably... Yeah, you can probably get rid of that. And then well, the only geez, question man. is, do you say anything about... I th This condition may do it. If additional plantings are required in order to achieve or maintain a buffer, new planting shall be pollinators. Do we want to keep the thing in about tall as practical and 50% pollinators or just take out as tall or just keep the part about being as tall as practical? And that should I come think after. Tall, I, think, I think tall as practical at least expresses a sentiment that we want to protect the, the neighbor's view. I would leave that in. Tall is practical gives whoever's building a big fat loophole to drive through. So <laughs> I don't think that's being overbearing. 
to have something in there expressing a uh, a desire to protect the neighbors. Okay. So we have six conditions in all. Right. Okay. All right. Anything else, given that I have backed off my generator and my tall plantings? Is there anything else that anybody wants to bring up from the panel? Okay. So we are currently in a public meeting where we read all of this. We have conditions. We have findings and conditions are all read. So um, we could, at this point, entertain a motion to approve the findings and conditions as amended. Is there so such a motion impending here? So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Is there a second? Sure. Oh, I think I already heard Mr. Meadows. We it, The motion is moved and seconded is there any discussion? The vote occurs on a roll call. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. The vote is four to zero. The motion passes. And I believe that the next vote is uh, on a motion to approve the application for a flag lot. What the Mr. conditions? Mr. Reedy, are you ready to go through with this vote, not knowing what I'm going to say? I'm willing to roll the <laughs> dice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so can I hear a mo can I hear a motion? Um, to approve the application for the flag lot with the findings and conditions as amended included in our ruling. So moved. Thank you, so moved. Mr. Meadows. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Second, Mr. Henry. Uh, the Any discussion? Then the vote occurs on a roll call. Does the chair have to vote first? I'd like no. to keep Mr. Reedy as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> no. You uh, vote last. The, the, the chair votes aye. <laughs> Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. The vote Thank is you. for, pardon me? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I didn't. I didn't announce that that it passed. <laughs> Calm down. The vote is four to zero, and it looks like it passes. It passes. So the application to establish a flag lot is approved. Congratulations, Mr. Clayt, and your your support staff here, and. Um, you're, it's approved. Congratulations. We wish you success and a successful, non-intrusive, non-annoying development next to your abutters. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. So Thank you. you can go. You can go take a nap, Mister Reedy. Finally. I know. I know. All right. So the next. Now that that's finished. The you may next... want to close the public hearing. I don't know yeah. that you did that. Good, good thinking. He was getting Thank to you. that, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody is enlisted to keep me focused since <laughs> I have not done this as many times as chair judge. <laughs> we um, now um, can close the public meeting, which will also, I believe, close the public hearing. Does well, it? I would, I would just say I'm going to close the public hearing. Just close the public hearing. I can do that. Okay. Yes. Then I'm going to close the public hearing on my own without any help from anybody. No, you still have to vote on it. Oh, we do have to vote on it. Yes. Oh, then I do need help. Okay. <laughs> All right. So do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved by Mr. Henry. Second. 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 Second by Mr. White. 
Excellent. The vote occurs on a roll call to, um, oh, any discussion? Okay. The vote occurs on a roll call to close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Uh, Chair votes aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. The vote is four to zero. The motion passes. The public hearing is closed. Now we have to close the public meeting. Wait, is that a was that no. you want to say something? Or you're no, waving? I was waving. You're you're fine. You've closed you're, the public hearing. That's all that we care you're about. You're waving goodbye. I'm waving <laughs> goodbye. You can <laughs> goodbye. You've done what you needed Bye, to Mr. do, Mr. Reedy. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. See you soon. Thank you. You too. <laughs> um, now we can vote to close the public meeting. I believe. I don't think you have to. I don't think we have to, and therefore we're not going to. Right. It's already closed. It's or closed. Or it will be at some point. <laughs> so, Well, now, if you don't count the 20-day appeal period. <laughs> we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to talk no, about that. No, we won't no. give anyone any ideas. Right. So now <laughs> we're going to welcome back Mr. Varner, who has apparently the patience of a saint hanging around all this time, <laughs> just as the viewer. Welcome back, John. <laughs> Uh, the next thing is a general public comment period. Is there anybody, Ms. Williams, who wants to make a general public comment? Um, no. no, no, they're not. Okay, so we will move on to other business not anticipated within 48 hours. Does that exist? I don't have anything to report. No. Anybody no. else have anything to report? No? Okay. I can report that the weather has been an absolute delight earlier this week, and it's due to end by the end of the weekend, and I will be sorry to see it go. But it's been a joy to have this in late October. And that was not anticipated within 48 hours, so <laughs> there you are. Um. Is there any, Ms. Williams, is there, we usually go over a schedule at this point. Yeah. Is there anything on. that you want to tell us that's different from the schedule or do you want to go over it? I know there's a we bunch can of take a, We can oh. take a look at it just <clears throat> okay. so that we did our due diligence. Right. So we're here. We wrapped up both of these. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Um, so now we're moving into November, November 14th. So we have a break. Yeah, we let's, do. Uh, well, you Two have weeks. a break. Two weeks. <laughs> and I've got meeting minutes to do. Um, but yes, the next meeting is November 14th, and it will be half Wayfinders and half ZBA. And at this meeting, we are anticipating Shootsbury Solar coming back. Um, I don't know right. if they will continue or not, so we'll see. Okay, but that is the schedule so far. Um, then on the 21st, we have a Wayfinders only meeting, then right. there is a holiday on the 28th, I believe. We're closed, we're not doing okay. anything, no meetings. No meetings. 12 12 will be a half Wayfinders meeting, half CBA. We may have two. Possibly more. Everyone decided to apply for lots of things at the last minute. So fun times for me. Um, we'll try to squeeze in as much as possible between whatever we, wherever we can for the last two or three meetings. So that's what the end of the year is looking like. And then so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. if you're curious, the next meeting would be, or the first meeting in the new year would be January 9th. But we don't know if it will be a Wayfinders meeting or just purely dedicated to ZBA business. Okay. And just to confirm, no meeting on November 28th and also no meeting on December 5. No, there's a meeting on December 12th. December 5. Oh, that's correct. No meeting on December okay, so 5th. That's two weeks. Okay. Fine. And no meeting next week. Or the week after. Mm -mm. So as no. Mr. Henry said, we get a two-week break. 
And I get next Thursday, a Thursday, which is date night here, and I already have reservations. So that's exciting that I get to go out on a Thursday. Okay. Okay. So that is the schedule. Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing else from anyone on the panel, I would be happy to entertain a, a motion to adjourn later than normal, but we actually got a lot done tonight, I think. So does anybody want the honor of the motion to adjourn and the joy? I think, okay, Mr. Henry, you've done yeoman <laughs> work tonight. You get that. And I think that Mr. Varner should have the honor of seconding it because be he stuck around. Do you second it, Mr. Varner? I do second it. And I'm proud of you for doing it. Um, this is not debatable. <laughs> according to Mr. Mr. Judge or any of us, um, uh, the motion occurs on a vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Varner? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. And the glorious Mr. Meadows? Aye. Well done. It passes five to zero. We are adjourned and concluded. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your support and keeping me honest and directed tonight. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for making so, this so enjoyable. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you See all. You in two weeks. Bye See you in two weeks. Yes. Two Have weeks. a great night, everybody. Thank you all.